I was on a fishing trip with my uncle. I normally am not up for that sort of thing. But come on, the man was dying of cancer. He had spent most of his life trying to get me to like fishing, and he had all but failed. So, his wishes were that I would go fishing with him, and at least pretend to be enjoying myself. I couldn't say no to something like that, especially under those circumstances. I met my uncle on his own property. He owned the better part of three smaller lakes in Tennessee. Well, they weren't really lakes. They were more like oversized ponds, not recognized as lakes by any stretch of the means. It was the kind of land that you could just live off of and just forget about any concept of an outside world with cares and problems and troubles. That was pretty much what my uncle had done. He got wrapped up in spending all of his free time lost in the fantasy world of fishing until the reality of the disease came calling, leading his mortality on a leash. And somewhere in all of that, one of the first things he had thought of was me. So, how do I say no to something like that? We pushed off and got rather far away from shore. I had forgotten just how much land my uncle had truly owned. My uncle sat back in the little rowboat and tipped his hat over his eyes and fell asleep. I shook my head and ceased pretending to be interested whether my fishing line really got anything or not. I loved the man but the business of becoming a vegetable while waiting for a fish to take bait just really wasn't my thing. I was lost in a restless daydream when my line not only went taut, but the entire rod was yanked out of the boat. It took me one second too long to respond and the whole thing was now lost in the water. I couldn't imagine what sort of thing was big enough to take away my uncle's equipment so quickly and with so much force. Unfortunately, I wouldn't have to imagine very long. Somewhere, in the cloak of the mist that hugged the water, I heard what sounded to be a great deal of splashing. Then, I heard growling, mingled with a yelping sound. Something was in pain, and it didn't sound like a fish. Then, came a very frustrated howl as two points of dim light danced somewhere in the gray void. I did the dumb thing and I began to row toward it. Heedles of the possibility of coming across a raving lunatic or a pack of wild animals that could be panicked and dangerous if they were caught up in the fishing line. I had hoped that the two points of light were an indicator of people, but they were far far from it. Well, they turned out to be eyes. It was like something from an old cartoon that I used to watch when I was a kid. A towering monster, a wolf thing, that had gotten the hook sunk into its body and was having a dickens of time getting it out. Its clawed fingers weren't suited for the fine manipulation it would take to work a small but sturdy hook out of its body and was getting now stuck in the line. The thing was visibly angry, and perhaps distraught. The sight of it alone was terrifying, and had I been more attuned to animals, I might have had a mind to help it if it didn't stand more than seven feet tall and walk around like you or I. What kind of wolf creature walks around on its hind legs? Werewolves, that's what. But. I had absolutely no preparation in my mind for ever running into such a thing, so I was speechless and directionless. I ended up rowing away quietly, hoping that it wouldn't catch our scent and come after us. It bolted off into the woods, with the line still wrapped around it. I had a hell of a time explaining to my uncle what happened to his fishing gear when he woke up. I should clarify that this thing clearly looked strong enough to break the line, but that didn't seem to be the problem. The hook seemed to be lodged somewhere in its chest. I don't know how or what, 
but it seemed like it was having a really hard time digging it out, being halfway into the water in the mist. And I don't know why it bolted away, or why it didn't come after us. Either way, it was completely and absolutely frightening. I'm just glad my uncle didn't see it. The poor old man would have probably had a heart attack. A few years ago, a whole bunch of us went camping. There were nine of us altogether. Six guys, three girls, and we shared three big tents between us. We were all of college age, and there was a lot of drinking, flirting, and just fun times all around. On that first morning, the girls all complained that one of the guys had used the outside of their tent as a toilet during the night. Now, most of us had a little too much to drink, but not one of us could recall doing anything as gross as that. Three out of the six admitted that they'd woken up to pee during the night, but all claimed to have used the trees, and two even said, despite the hour and grogginess, they'd taken some water to wash the nastiness away. We might have been young and foolish, but none of us were that gross, and we all kind of liked these girls anyway. And if anything, we wanted to impress them, not mark our territory on their tent. Next morning, same complaint. The girls swore they'd been woken up to the sound of somebody urinating on the side of the tent. It was so loud, and such a powerful flow, it had woken them up from a deep sleep. They'd almost come out of the tent and confronted whoever it was, but they were all too tired, and it was too cold. It was also raining. This time, none of the guys could remember getting up to use the tree bathroom. One had woken up early, like 5 a.m. to go, but the girls said this was in the middle of the night. They were getting a bit annoyed, and there was definitely the strong smell of pee on the tent but it kind of had a weird smell to it. Not human urine. It kind of had a smell that I can't quite describe. We washed it away and wondered if we had a liar, or more likely a sleep peer in our midst. One of the guys actually made the sensible suggestion that the most plausible explanation was that it was indeed an animal, especially considering the smell like I just said, wasn't quite human smelling. Something that came over to the campsite on the night to scavenge for leftovers and then left a little thank you. The girls scoffed at this, though as they said the flow had been so loud the previous night that they could actually tell where it was hitting the fabric. And there's no animal that big or that stood up to pee like a dude. They actually insisted we all used the bathroom on the site, not the trees, before we hit the sack on our final night. They were pissed, and it was clear that none of us were in their good books, as we were all suspects. We also decided the only way to unmask the villain was as soon as the girls heard the noise, they were to yell, and we'd look out in our tents to see which one of us was missing. Sure enough again, Around 2.30 a.m., there was a loud enough to wake the dead and yell and to scream. I woke up super fast and shone the light in my tent. One, two, and three. So it wasn't any of us. I heard scrambling in the other guy tent and a shout, not us. Screw this, I thought. Opened the tent flap and quickly shone my light at the girls. I heard another scream as I caught the culprit in my flash beam. At first, I thought it was a tweaker. They were really tall and skinny and had their back to me, which I hadn't noticed in the shock of seeing somebody actually there in the darkness that was this person, covered in thick gray and brown hair. And then, they or it or whatever the hell you call it, looked at me. It screamed. I screamed. 
The girls then screamed. Except this thing wasn't screaming because it was scared. It was a very intimidating, angry scream. Like half human, half animal being hurt. It was the most disturbing thing I've ever seen. The only way I can describe it is it was very slender, very skinny, very hairy, with a head that looked just like a dog's. It was really gross looking, and despite it having this messed up head, it had this horrifying scream, a nasty, terrifying noise. Once I got over the initial shock, I leapt out of the tent. To be honest, I don't know exactly what I intended to do, but I felt like I should do something. Luckily, rather than launch into an attack, it screamed even more and then ran off. And when I say ran, this thing was like the flash. It was there one moment, then poof, gone. It was so fast it was almost unnatural. The girls were in hysterics, and I wasn't far behind. The guys, on the other hand, in the tent, hadn't gotten the best look, but had just caught a glimpse of the thing before it ran, just like the wind. The girls all swore up and down. They wanted to leave, but we managed to placate them by spreading them out into the two guy tents, just until the sun rose, and we had enough light to pack up safely. Whatever that thing was, it was messed up. The only saving grace was that it genuinely didn't seem to want to hurt us. Maybe it was marking its territory. I don't know. But who knows what might have happened if there hadn't been so many people. I know one thing is for certain, and that's that we will never choose that spot to go camping again. This isn't my story, but my great-grandfather's. During the time of Prohibition, where government men roamed the hills of the wilderness, looking for moonshine stills to cut down, my great-grandfather, whom we'll call Albert, was one of the more successful revenuers. He had an intuition that didn't lie, whereas them hillbillies used the land to warn themselves of oncoming types like Albert, such as by noting the wildlife getting real, real quiet, real quick, or there being bursts of birds in the air or squirrels running from one direction. Albert knew how to muffle his steps and not to set off any awareness, or if he did, he did it in such a way that threw people off as to what he was actually up to. One thing he learned for sure was that there was no way to move across the land in perfect silence. The hills were alive, and every step had some sort of effect. It either reacted to your movement or your presence. There was never no reaction at all. So, Albert was closing in on one of the biggest moonshine operations he had been commissioned to take down, and it would mean putting a dent in as much as 23% of the current flow of booze from these hills. He was pretty sure he had bagged them down one day, when he spotted thick columns of smoke in the sky. Maybe they just had gotten careless. It didn't matter. He had a promotion to collect if he could make this one job count. He wasn't able to read the land like he should have. That much smoke had to have mean that there was a disaster, and a disaster meant that there should have been more scramble of human activity to get it under control but the hills weren't agitated above more than average. This puzzled Albert greatly, and for the first time, he was very apprehensive. He found the property. There was one or two stills in a wood, but the real work was being done in an unusually long barn where three stills were in full production. The fires for all three were burning out of control, and whomever owned the barn was about to lose it. Amidst all the smoke and chaos, Albert spotted no less than four bodies all around the perimeter of the barn. They weren't overwhelmed by smoke. 
they were ripped open and clawed up, looking like the work of a bear, except bears eat what they kill. These poor souls were just mauled and left. Albert approached the barn door just in time to be knocked aside by another man firing a shotgun like a nut. Somehow, both slugs missed Albert, but he wasn't sure if he was even the target. That's when he saw a furry shape, moving too quickly to see, had jumped out of the barn and was on the shotgun man in a blur. Albert watched in horror as this monstrous looking thing that looked to be half man, half wolf, made quick work of the panicked man. It shook Albert up pretty bad. He said he could hear the man's screams in his sleep, clear up until the day he had died. He dealt with that trauma for a long time. He always got very serious when he brought up the half man, half wolf thing, and said it wasn't at all like the 1950s horror movie, The Wolf Man. He said this was much more barbaric, animalistic, and terrifying. He was about to get his revolver out and put a few shots into this beast, but that didn't put it down. It only seemed to piss it off more before it bounded off into the woods. It let out a horrifying howl and wailed the whole way. And for some reason, it's not the cry that haunted Albert for years to come. I guess the government had seized all the property because, well, I guess there was nobody left alive to put up a fuss. Thoroughly retaken, it eventually ended up being Albert's property towards the end of his tenure. He tried to make a home out of it, but it just had too much baggage with it. He eventually sold it and used the money to buy himself some place a bit smaller and more isolated. My grandfather, Albert, didn't have one good night of sleep the rest of his life. I've heard this story so many times growing up, and even more so before he died. I'm pretty sure he just wanted to make sure that it was never forgotten about. He tells me that he wasn't sure why this thing let him live, because it could have easily mauled him, just like it mauled the five other men before him. And this thing did some pretty nasty damage, he told me. It was pretty gory. He never went into great depth of detail about what the bodies looked like or the true damage that had been done, but he always compared it to a nasty bear kill. And it's quite obvious how nasty bears can kill and maul a person, let alone an animal, even before they decide to eat it. I'm writing in to tell you about something that I saw last night on my way home from a drive-in. It was dark, and there are a hell of a lot of trees, either side of the road, but I know what I saw. Well, I don't know what it is, but I know that I saw it. I had my headlights on, because as I said, it was dark and this part of the road seems dark, even in the daytime because of the trees. I could just about make out the head, a very, very weird shape in the middle of the road. This isn't wholly unusual. There are all sorts of animals out here at night, and after all, many are nocturnal, so this is really their time. I guess they thought that I was the one that shouldn't be there. So I hit the horn a couple of times and flashed my brights. But that's usually more than enough to scare off any kind of critter. But it didn't move. It just stood there. I began thinking the other obvious point. Whatever it was was now dead. That left me with the dilemma of whether I could get the car around it when all of a sudden this thing got up. I won't repeat exactly what I thought, but you can bet there was a whole bunch of cursing and screaming coming out of my mouth, because in front of me, I could see pretty clearly now, was some sort of really tall hyena creature. And when I say tall, I mean like really tall, like a person. 
basically, in front of me, clear in the headlights, was a hyena that stood up on two legs, just like a person, complete with that sort of weird spotty hair they got, and a weird face with a sort of arched back. It was definitely hyena-like, but it looked wrong, and it stood on two legs, which was wrong to begin with. It seemed to stand its ground as I got closer. I have to admit in my shock and panic, I was just heading towards it still. No thoughts of slowing down. At the last minute, literally, right before I would have mowed it down, it jumped out of the way and sped off far into the trees. I just kept driving. I needed to. I needed to get home before I could really allow myself to think about what I just saw. Was it a dog man? I don't know. It didn't look like a dog. It was pure hyena. So, a hyena man? I just don't know. Which is why I'm telling you. To see what you and the people that listen to your show think. Thanks for taking the time to read my story. My dad loves to hunt. We live just outside of Denver and there are a lot of different things that he can shoot at. He even works in an outdoor store, so he justifies hours killing animals by saying it's research for the store, and he is trialing the goods to let the customers know just how good or not good they work. Whatever. I'm not really anti-hunting, or even that bothered about him being away for hours at the weekend as it is usually really early in the morning, and I'm too busy sleeping. Thankfully, my younger brother is more into it than me, so if dad fancies company, it's my brother that gets woken up at like 3 a.m., not me. One rule my mother always insisted on is that my dad comes home clean. We all know what he does, but she doesn't want his bloody cargoes coming back into the house so he goes to the store after a hunt and cleans up. And if he has brought back a kill, it has to be dealt with first. She has no qualms about cooking up whatever the hell he's shot, but won't entertain the idea of skinning it and chopping it up. It's like if it's presented to her in neat steaks, she can pretend it's some chicken or beef she bought at the store, not like bobcat or bear or something. I learned a long time ago not to ask what I was eating. Dad has only ever broken the rule of coming home clean once, and that's the tale I'm going to tell you about. It was just a regular Sunday morning in the fall. He'd headed out nice and early to catch whatever it was, a deer, a boar, or something, and was planning on heading back in time for lunch and the game. Josh and I, my brother, by the way, had enjoyed a lie and some video games in the morning while mom was fixing food. It was still a couple of hours until my father was due back. So when the back door swung open and he was covered in blood and a loaded shotgun still in hand, that was mom's over, but actually more important rule. No guns in the house. They were to be stored in a locked cabinet in the garage. We were all stunned. My brother was more used to seeing Dad like that than anybody, and afterwards, even he said he'd never seen so much blood. My mother was starting to get mad, and she seemed worried, asking Dad if the blood was his. That seemed to be the only reasonable explanation as to why he would take a 20-year promise of not wearing his hunting stuff in the house. I remember him shaking his head, said he wasn't hurt, the blood was not his. That was when mom started to get mad again. Dad, however, seemed to totally ignore her and sat down at the table, still bloody, and placed the gun down. I asked my father what was going on. This was in no way normal, completely out of his character. 
He might have taught me how to load a gun, almost before I could ride a bike. But gun safety was the law, and I had never seen this gun in the house. I would asked him a second time what had happened. He gave me a look, almost as if seeing me for the first time. He picked up the gun, emptying the shells, placing it back on the table. At this point, I think my mother relented and realized something weird was going on. Like, properly weird. She even asked what had happened. Then my father proceeded to tell us what had happened. He said he'd been stalking whatever animal he was looking for, and he'd been about to shoot when he heard a really loud noise. My father's kind of a mountain man. He doesn't really scare easy. The woods have really desensitized him, and he had his gun. But he is also very smart. He's not an idiot. He immediately went into defensive mode and tried to locate where the noise had come from that he had never heard before. He was also trying to identify it. He said it sounded kind of like a wild dog, but had a very distinct timbre to the noise. He had crouched down, aimed in the general direction the noise was coming from, and stayed solemnly still. The noise, what he could make out to be a very, very low-pitched growling sound, was then joined by a loud roaring, a really odd, deep, guttural roar, which was quickly followed by what sounded like a screeching sound. Still, with the gun pointed in the general direction where the noise appeared to be centered, he started to quietly creep towards it. And then... Dad told us exactly what was making that noise. As he rounded the trees that had been covering what he now presumed to be a wild dog, he had his gun pointed down towards the floor, because that was obviously where he expected the creature to be. What he had not expected, and would have never imagined in his wildest dreams, was that this dog that he was about to meet would actually be bigger and larger than him, and even reared up on two legs. Oh, and there were two of them. The roaring and growling and screeching. That's right. They stood just a few feet in front of him. Two things that can only be what I know to be dogmen. Tall. Much taller than my dad. He is six foot fair. But my dad can only think to protect himself against something like this. Something big, broad, jet black, and faces that he said resembled Doberman pinchers, which I thought was interesting. He blasted his shotgun and hit both at least once, hence the blood. They both turned and ran, and he ran back to his truck, straight home. He was telling us he had never felt such primal fear in his life. He's experienced he knows to never run from predatory animals. But he said he's never had this kind of primal fear overtake him before. My brother might be 12, but he began to cry. Mom looked like she wanted to join in. I think I even considered it. In a way, our shocked response seemed to be what Dad needed. He suddenly shot up from the table and said he was going to go to the store scooped up the gun and apologized and without saying anything else left those next few hours were brutal but finally dad came back home along with a couple of his friends they'd been back to the exact spot but unable to find these things they knew it was the right spot because there was a lot of blood surprisingly there was even a trail of blood but it stopped and there were no bodies to be found. They had looked all around for a few hours, but didn't see or hear anything. Nothing. Not even the sound of another creature or bird. In fact, the entire time, the woods felt eerie and even deathly quiet. They've been back several times, but these dogmen, to what I know, have never been spotted a second time. My father thinks he must have killed them, 
and maybe another animal had dragged them off because things just don't disappear. But then, six-foot, two-legged dogs don't exist either. I know about cryptids, and so I knew exactly what this was. But my dad doesn't even believe in Bigfoot, so I think he was the most shocked by all of this. My brother and mother both think it's all hogwash too, but they can't deny my father's genuine reaction of fear and worry, hence why they're scared. I'm not even sure what to make of it myself. Not that I don't believe my dad, and not that I don't believe dogmen exist. It just seems so surreal that my own father would have a run-in with these supposed mystical creatures. I did a really stupid thing and fell asleep in a boat on the bayous. Considering that the gators and croc population was up in those days, that was an especially stupid thing for me to do. But I had been drinking, and the swamp sounds had been so soothing. I felt succumbed to the relaxation and conked out. I woke up to the sight of what looked like logs with eyes drifting all around me. I knew that if I started rowing, those logs would beeline me, and I'd be in for a world of trouble. I hoped they would go away on their own. That turned out to be a very foolish hope. The exact opposite happened. One of them got tired of waiting and started carving V-shaped ripples as it headed straight for me. Now, maybe it was the liquor or the hangover from it, but I watched as that crocodile or alligator, whatever it is, came straight for me and I was ready to go. But then there was a ripple on the surface and some bubbles, and the alligator, or whatever, was gone. Stranger yet, the others started fleeing from my location. I was expecting the once submerged alligator to launch itself out of the water and slam itself into my boat. Instead, it emerged on a far bank and it looked like it was scrambling for its life. I kid you not, a large black clawed hand reached out of the water and grabbed its tail and yanked it back under the water with such incredible force that this thing stood no chance. Now, I don't know how much you know about the autonomy of an alligator, but the tail ain't the weakest part of their body by far. The simple fact that this animal was wrestled back into the water by its tail, with one hand at that, raised some serious questions about what sort of thing or person was manhandling it. A few moments later, I could see there was no man to do the manhandling. The chaotic splashing drifted over to the bank, where I could only describe it as a towering monster that looked like a wolf coated in slime emerged with an iron grip on the croc's dead body. Thrash as it may, there was just no escaping, and it was one of the bigger alligators I had ever seen. For a moment, I thought the whole thing would turn around with the alligator it got in its jaws and the large head of a monster, but the thing took its two massive claws and grabbed either side of the mouth and pulled it open very wide. I could hear the jaws snap, and I knew right away the animal had been broken. This hulking wolf monster then proceeded to bash its prey against a tree in rage. Ever see a croc get its brains beaten out? I did that day. It was as terrific as it was terrifying. Even though I stood to be lunch just a few minutes earlier, I couldn't help but feel sorry. It literally had no fighting chance and might as well have been a puppy in the clutches of an eagle. If you'd met me, you'd see that my hands shake. It's why my voice shakes too. I came so close to death and then I watched death incarnate in the flesh rise up and break a predator that I feared as if it were just a mere toy. This is why I stay out of the bayous. 
I've heard tales of what people describe as hulking-sized werewolves, but I always just thought it was wives' tales. Silly ghost stories to scare kids that are told around the campfire. That is, until I saw it for myself. I was more amazed at the sheer size of this animal, or creature, or thing. It was kind of like a human, except nearly eight to nine feet tall, with a massive Arnold Schwarzenegger-like body, covered in thick, long, black hair, with a massive head of that of a wolf. To say it was a werewolf, well, I don't believe in people changing into wolves at a full moon, but aesthetically, this thing lined up with what many consider to be a werewolf, except it looked much more fierce and hulking than I could have ever imagined. This is why I now, permanently, stay out of the swamps. I know those tales are real. I don't know if they're demons or if they're living animals, or whatever they are. I prefer to consider them guardians of the swamp. And I guess that day, however you want to look at it, this thing was looking out for me. Or so I'd like to think. I rented a cabin in the hills of Tennessee for my wife and I's 45th anniversary. My wife and I both challenged ourselves to a level of roughing it than either of us were ever used to. We used to tease each other that if we could survive this marriage, we could survive anything. You would have thought that things were going off without a hitch. The weather was gorgeous, and we settled into the isolation of the cabin just fine. The nights were cool, and I regretted not getting a place with glass in the windows. But I wasn't going to admit that to my wife, and I was sure she wasn't going to admit that to me either. Both of us snored, and it was a guess who would be woken up by the other, whoever was the first to complain. Well, I woke up first, but there was more to be heard in the darkness than my wife sawing logs. There seemed to be a sound coming from just outside the window, right above our bed. It was a bestial grunting that I couldn't place. It was too soft to be outdone by the sound of my wife's snoring. I curled up against the cold fresh air that drifted in. But there was a smell of wet dog that would drift in on the edge of my senses at very odd intervals. And just as soon as I was sure that's what I was smelling, it was then gone. Bobbing in and out of sleep, it occurred to me that there could somehow be a lunatic skulking around the property outside. If that were the case, we were in a fix, being so far away from the police. I was no dummy. I packed a 10 millimeter and kept it nearby at all times. The smell and the sounds remained very close to our window. When I felt that I was awake enough, I slipped out of bed as quietly as possible and took the gun from the dresser. I quietly slid a magazine into it and readied myself for a confrontation outside. Though the window was without glass, it had narrow wooden bars, so I was sure that I could safely leave my wife's side. When I came around to the side of the cabin, where I was sure I would find a madman crouched beneath the window, I found instead a great large mass of shadow that was just no making sense of. It was furry, and my brain tried to tell me it was a bear, but it just wasn't the right shape. It then turned its head toward me, which gave me a start. I thought I had come to its side of the cabin in perfect stealth. I don't remember ever hearing bears with glowing eyes. This wasn't that reflective light like you see in cats. This was almost like the light of a candle, except it was coming inside the beast's eyes. It went from crouching to standing, and it was absolutely massive. What I thought were demonic horns turned out to be long ears that were no less hellish. I felt my gun was shrinking in my hand, 
and it made it all the more urgent that I shoot the monster stalking me and my wife. I almost didn't take the shot as it neared me. It seemed to grow in size exponentially. I finally couldn't take it anymore, and I raised my colt and fired into the threatening shadow. I surprised it. I'll never know if I heard it. It had charged me, but changed its trajectory a bit when the bullets found their marks. Claws grazed my ribs. My wife woke me up in the daylight, spilling across the grass. My wounds weren't as bad as they could have been. I made it through our anniversary somewhat tender. We made it a point to never go back to that very remote location. We didn't need the addition of monstrous wolf demon things to negotiate with. And my wounds were only superficial at best. I don't think this thing's intentions were at trying to hurt me or kill me. I think, honestly, it was bluff charging me and just gave me a clean swipe. With as big as this thing was, it could have honestly ripped me in two, so I don't know why it basically tickled me with its claws. Again, my wounds weren't terribly deep. They have left scars, but nothing I couldn't deal with. Nothing that I needed to go to the hospital with. As far as what I encountered, it's the only thing I can think of is a wolf man, or some sort of giant upright walking wolf that now stalks the woods of Tennessee. My wife, however, doesn't know about this because I told her it was a bear. When I was a kid, Halloween, and especially trick-or-treating was by far my most favorite time of the year. Even more so that Christmas or birthdays just couldn't match up to. It wasn't just because of the candy, although obviously that was great too. But what I really enjoyed was dressing up and then walking around the neighborhood with my buddies. I love seeing everybody else and oftentimes even adults in costumes visiting houses where people had spent hours decorating. It was fun and safe, and everybody knew everyone. We always had a blast every year. This particular event happened right around 1996 or 1997. I was 10 or 11 years old. Since we were beginning to get a little older, our costumes were beginning to get a little more elaborate and more scary. There were some real spooky and realistic looking ghosts and vampires, and even creatures from the Black Lagoon. There were even a couple of werewolves, which I was both fascinated by and also terrified of. Of all the nightmare creatures, it was actually werewolves that scared me the most. I had seen American Werewolf in London, the Howling series, and that one by Stephen King. I think it's called Silver Bullet but I can't be too sure. Those movies, werewolves in general just scared me, but I had this weird, morbid love for them. Anyway, we never saw it as a contest. If you were a witch and you saw another witch, you gave that kid a high five. This was a fun night. Not the time to sulk that somebody had a nicer, pointier hat or a bigger fake wart on their nose. So when the kid, wearing an unbelievably cool dog costume, I didn't care that it was way more realistic than it was weird, because he kept disappearing and then reappearing at the house we were calling at. Like he was there one minute, staring at us with his dog face, and then gone, back again. It was strange. One of the girls I was with, Sadie, was a bit more nosy, and this kid doing weird magic tricks was really getting to her. She wanted to know who it was, how he had gotten such a realistic looking costume, and how he had kept ducking out without seeing us. So, once we got a hit up with candy bars, she turned to me and told me that I'm gonna have to go talk to that kid. Now, another thing about nosy Sadie, you did as she said. She began to walk down to where we had saw this kid reappearing behind the brush. Only that's when this story 
went from a cute Halloween story to absolutely real and terrifying. Not long before there, maybe, I don't know, 60 feet, if I had a guess from memory, was thick wilderness that branched the entire end of that entire neighborhood. I'm not really sure what lied beyond there. It was kind of just the ending point of that whole neighborhood. Well, as we approached the brush that we were seeing this, what we thought was a kid, we saw that same kid stand up, even taller than before. And since we were closer, we realized that this possibly wasn't somebody or something in a costume because it stood up very tall. Not too much taller than us, but a little bit taller. And it even had glowing yellow eyes and took off running into the woods where we turned and saw another one much, much larger. Probably about double the size of the one that stood up in front of us behind the brush that ran into the woods. That one seemed to be utterly massive with glowing red eyes staring at us. We were terrified. That's when it began letting out a low growl, holding onto the trees, slowly making its way out in the open. Of course it was nighttime and it was dark over there, but we could still see the general silhouette and shapes of it, even through the dim lighting. We took off running, wondering if this thing had decided to make itself known on Halloween night. Looking back as an adult, I know now more about creatures and cryptids that aren't supposed to exist. My adult perspective is this, that somehow, and keep in mind that it just so happened to be Halloween, which has nothing to do with this thing appearing, I just think it was a coincidence. I believe we saw an adolescent dogman that was curious and was watching us trick-or-treating. When we approached it, it ran off, and the much, much bigger one was probably the alpha male, or the female, the parent of the adolescent. Why it never attacked us? Well, maybe it was just giving off a very threatening growl to warn us. I don't know, but I know these things exist. I know they're out there, as terrifying as it was. I understand it might sound cheesy and hokey that we happen to see it on Halloween, but I'll just reiterate that I don't think us seeing this thing on Halloween night had any coincidence whatsoever. It was just by chance. I was camping by myself in a few of the pines that surrounded the Rockies. What can I say? I used to be a loner. You can't really experience the wilderness unless you experience it completely alone and in isolation. Anyway, night was falling rapidly and I did the responsible thing. I extinguished the fire, but I also did the smart thing and I buried some of the embers. The insulation of the ground would keep them hot and I'll be able to start my fire afresh the next day. I got in my tent. I lay down facing the tent opening and I left it open slightly. And I don't feel this so much as a safety issue as it is a matter of survival. Like the dog that walks around and circles several times before it finally lays down. I like to make sure that I'm going to be safe. I'm a very light sleeper and the slightest disturbance will wake me up and I'll be ready to defend myself in full. Well, there was a disturbance. I opened my eyes and I looked out into the crack of the tent into the darkness where I thought I saw some of the embers of the fire. This confused me and I even questioned if I was still dreaming because I know for a fact that I had extinguished the fire. It was when the embers weren't doing anything except hovering in the air that my senses started to tell me something wasn't right. Other details started slipping my fog of sleep, such as the fact that the two embers weren't red nor orange. They were yellow, almost amber. For a split second, they blinked 
as if they were eyes. With my heart pounding in my head, I reached beside me for my pistol and my flashlight. What happened next? A very quick succession, but the intensity of it all made it seem to last for hours. I lit this thing up with my flashlight. I came face to face with the most grotesque wolf-like gargoyle creature I had ever laid my eyes on. Its back was hunched, claws like scythes, and the hatred and malice that poured and emanated out of this being was more starkly displayed in its features than its facial expression. I know, I landed one or two good shots on it, but that somehow didn't stop it. Maybe it succumbed to its wounds later on, assuming it was a mortal creature. I know that might sound hokey, but I've never heard of a creature like this. I'll know for sure that if I see it next time, I'm putting it down for good. Hopefully, this is the last time I'll have ever seen it.